Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Zach Norris, Executive Director of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, and Paula Thompson, Executive Director for Voices for a Second Chance. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webcast guests that you can ask questions to the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of, the, of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show or afterwards. I'm so happy that you're both here today to again chat about how we heal America and how we uh, help people who have interacted with uh, various parts of our uh, criminal justice system to come back into society and make their contribution. Zach, why don't we start with you and talk about the uh, work of the Ella Baker Center and its genesis and about Ella Baker. Right on. Uh, thank you, Mark, really appreciate it. Uh, glad to be on the show. And my name is Zach Norris. I'm the executive director of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. And we're named after Ella Baker, who was a brilliant black woman, a leader in decades upon decades of, of struggle for freedom, equality, opportunity. And she believed in the power of everyday people to make change. And we try to build on her legacy by advocating for our books, not bars, jobs, not jails, health care, not handcuffs agenda. So we love alliteration and we love to really bring resources towards a social safety net um, rather than a punishment dragnet that we've seen um, really predominate, especially in these last 40 years in the United States. And so that's our work at, at the Ella Baker Center. We're based in Oakland, California, but we are known in different parts throughout, throughout the country. And uh, talk a little bit about the, the nickname Fundi Ella, uh, Ella yeah. Baker. Yeah, so Ella Baker was known as Fundi. Um, she was a leader, especially for young people. And one of the things that, um, you know, you and I were just remarking about is the way in which she um, always was learning. She um, organized with students and sharecroppers alike, and she really believed in the power of young people. She was one of the mentors for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, and really helped to grow that movement and help young people to see the leadership in themselves. And that's, that's why our t-shirt, if you can see it, it says, she led, so can you. Um, and that's kind of our motto is really trying to build on the leadership of everyone. And we've done that. We, we, we engaged in a campaign around the turn of the century that I was involved in as a young person. And um, Alameda County, which is supposed to be, you know, progressive bastion, wanted to build the largest per capita juvenile hall in the country at the time. And we said, no, this can't, this can't go forward. If you build it, you will fill it. And we brought uh, this kind of brand of hip hop activism. So young people taking over our board of supervisors meetings, doing poetry slams and even I tried to do a, a poem at one of these meetings. And I like to say the best thing about bad poetry is that it's still good protest because you still take your two minutes and they still have to hear from you. Um, and so we waged this campaign and, and, and over you know, a few years period, we were actually successful in getting them to downsize and relocate this, this massive super jail for youth that they wanted to build. So, so we like to think that we're continuing the spirit of Ella Baker in, in valuing the leadership of young people and valuing the leadership of every single person. And Fundi means uh, in Swahili mentor, mentor yes, Ella Baker. Uh, talk about how you uh, pursue your work and all the mentors that you have gathered around yourself to help uh, those people who are exiting the, uh, the incarceration system. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, the organization I um, have the privilege to lead is Voices for a Second Chance. We're located in Washington, D.C. and the nation's capital. And um, coincidentally, the nation capital um, also have the most folks who are incarcerated per capita in the nation. Um, we have been doing this work for 50 years. Um, and we, we look at our work um, under three pillars. And so the first is first responder where we work directly in jails um, and for our folks in DC is set up differently. We don't have a federal prison system. And what happens unfortunately is when our residents are sentenced, they are shipped across the country literally as far as California. 
And um, that's problematic in so many ways, um, just in, in their rehabilitation, but also not being able to stay connected to their community and family. And we all know that's important when someone is uh, returning um, from incarceration that the family support and being close to those resources are pivotal. So that's one pillar of our work um, called First Responder Services. The second is the Welcome Home Center. Um, we have worked for most of the 50 years directly with the Department of Corrections and the district where we go um, inside of the jail. This was all pre-COVID um, and we, we did intakes um, and short assessments and connect with individuals during their incarceration to support them. And so that is, um, that is some of the work that we did is under the first responder that leads into the reentry center. Um, and so we have the Welcome Home Center when folks are released from the DC jail and they also come home from Bureau of Prisons, they come to our center um, immediately to get support. And it's things as basic as a birth certificate. When folks are locked away for years and decades, they don't have their birth certificate and you need that in order to get an ID. Uh, we also help folks with getting um, clothing and helping with food. So those are like the immediate services that they need. And then beyond that, we provide case management um, and connect them and put together a reentry plan for them that they can move forward in their process. And then our third pillar, which is really important, um, is our, our voices section. And that's where we lift up the voices of our returning citizens that we work with so that they can lead the charge of what those services are that they need and the issues that they face when they come home. Well, it's the self-advocacy that is so important because if you can't advocate for yourself and in prison, self-advocacy is a very difficult uh, it's a very difficult environment in which to learn self-advocacy and to feel that the, that one has a right to to a voice because so many of your rights have been taken away. Um, yes. How do you find the appropriate balance to give voice and give voice in a way that that can be heard? Uh, one of the things that strikes me in terms of of this moment, where we have um, black men, black women um, being killed. Um, and uh, and uh, moving into interaction with the criminal justice system um, in, a, in a disproportionate way is that connection between our, um, our issues on race and the issues that so many of the people that you serve encounter in their lives and in trying to uh, evolve their lives in a positive direction. Could you talk about each of your uh, perspectives and the perspectives of the people that you serve in that respect? How, how do people that you uh, interact with see this present day, Zach? Um, yeah. And how, how, are, how are we to be informed, be mentored by their views? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And one of the things that I didn't speak to is just kind of what brings me to this work, which I think is intimately tied to your question. And growing up in East Oakland as a light-skinned African-American um, who went to Catholic school, I didn't really notice all of the privileges that I have. Um, I ended up um, uh, first, you know, in my family ever to, you know, leave the state to go to college, uh, went to Harvard University as an undergrad, and that's where I saw just how differently young people could be treated for doing some of the same things. So when I'm at Harvard, I see people getting in fights, using and abusing drugs, falling out of dor their dormitory windows, and thankfully they were okay, but like as a result of substance abuse, some really serious issues going on. But each time a young person at Harvard made a mistake, they got counseling, they got the support they needed, they got, at worst, they were given a, a semester off to kind of reflect on their actions and come back and resume their studies. Meanwhile, my family and friends were doing some of the same things, were being locked up and, and losing years upon years of their lives. And so I've come to understand that it's not, that there are racial disparities across races, but there are also racial disparities among races. So the lighter your skin color is, even among races, the lighter your sentence is likely to be for the same set of facts. And so um, those privileges, uh, those uh, injustices is really how I should frame it, is 
are not lost on me now and are part of what l led me to this work. And I think it's air apparent to everyone who has ever been through the system. Thankfully, it's starting to be more apparent to everyone else as well. If you look at some of the statistics around whether or not people, the police treat black folks unfairly, the, the statistics around when Eric Garner was killed versus George Floyd have really started to shift pretty drastically to where like nearly three out of four Americans are, or somewhere close to that are realizing that yes, black people are treated unfairly by the police, which has is no new news, right, among communities of color. That is not at all new news. Um, but I think, thankfully, we're starting to see some level of shift in public perception on that issue. And Paula, how, how do people uh, around you see this, this, these various connections? And what is their prescription for how we ought to change? How can we be informed by their views? And let me ask you, Mark, when you say the, the people around me, who are the people you're referring to? So you serve people who have, unlike me, um, uh, been uh, um, imprisoned for whatever the reason that they were imprisoned. Mm -hmm. um, those people have gained wisdom that I do not have. I do not have that wisdom as a white person. I do not have that wisdom as somebody who has never been imprisoned. I do not have the, the experience of exiting and entering and trying to uh, rebuild my life. Their success is important nevertheless to me because their success makes America stronger. Their ability to repair and recover for themselves but also inform society on how we can help that process is really important. So, I'm interested in learning from your experience and from uh, the people who know more about this area than I am, and, and, and that can affect my own behaviors and thinking. That's a good question, Mark, um, and thanks for clarifying it. Um, I think it's important, number one, is the fact that the, the, the folks that we work with that they should be invited into the conversation. What often happens is that it comes from um, a national view or an academia view, or they've been researched so much and they've been studied so much, but they've never been asked those questions. There's the folks who often are putting out um, documents to with, with proposed solutions about how can we do better for returning citizens, for folks who have been impacted? And it's not just the returning citizen, it's the entire family and community um, unit. And that's how we view it. Because when, when the community has been decimated from being underserved, from having the poorest education options, for being unemployed, literacy rates, that has been systemic for so long. And now with, and, and I'm encouraged by the protests and that the young people are leading the charge. Um, for our work, we've been seeing this for so long and we're glad that the light is being shown on it. Um, but I really feel that the folks that we work with, they should, they should be on the front line. They should be asked, what can we do to do better? And oftentimes they're absent from the conversation. We lift their voices and their needs up in our work every day. I mean, if we have support groups, our support groups are built around what the needs and the issues are. We know when folks are coming home and they've been away for decades, for one, they're returning to, to to DC and the city has been absolutely gentrified. And so they don't recognize their, their former neighborhood or their families may have moved on or they may have been deceased and there's no connection. And no one has stopped to ask them what it is that they need. You know, they come home and they are, um, first requirement is to see their probation officer, but emotionally they are broken they have been traumatized and um, they need supports in mental health. They need medical supports. And so if we're, we're going to get down to the root of what those basic needs are, if you're mentally and medically impaired, then how can you move forward as a contributing member of society? Yeah, I couldn't agree with Paula Moore, Mark. I mean, I think that uh, 
one of the reasons why we did a report called Who Pays the True Cost of Incarceration on Families was specifically because we wanted research done in the interest of community members, in the interest of folks who have been directly impacted. And so it was formerly incarcerated folks, it was um, their family members, it was survivors of crime who came together and designed the research questions, designed the survey instrument, and then with Forward Together and 20 other community-based organizations, we went out and surveyed over a thousand folks across the country from those same constituent groups. And, you know, it, it got a lot of coverage that the report did in the New York Times and CNN in 2015. Um, but most of the coverage focused on the problem. And it most of the coverage focused on the fact that, um, you know, women of color and in particular black women were paying the cost of incarceration. So it's not just, you know, you individual, you, you do the crime, you do the time. It's actually economic quicksand for the entire family when someone is involved in the justice system. And we wanted that message to get across. That's why we called it who pays the true cost of incarceration on families. But we also wanted to get across the solutions that folks were proposing. And I couldn't agree with Paula more that like we need to listen and learn. And so one of the things that we heard really loudly and clearly is that for, the, for folks um, impacted by the system, economic opportunity, um, restorative and transformative justice, um, being able to stay in your home uh, in the Bay Area, it, gentrification is also a huge issue. And so when we heard those things, we wanted to not just hear them, but to try to act on them. And so we built this new center called Restore Oakland in the heart of the Fruitvale District, one of the most diverse districts within a very diverse city. And we built out an 18,000 square foot, uh, renovated an 18,000 square foot building that features restorative justice that will feature a restaurant run by formerly incarcerated folks and others who have been locked out of opportunity. And we were partnering with Cause Ahusta Just Cause to help people fight eviction and stay in their homes. And we're trying to really shift the public imagination because so many people, when they hear the term public safety, they think of prison guards and bars and, and policing, but really what actually makes us safe is you know, good jobs and young people having an education that leads them to believe that they have a future ahead of them, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're really trying to help um, create a visual aid to show that a different way of thinking about safety is possible. And thank you both for, um, for bringing the, the families uh, into this. You know, the thing that strikes me is that given the cost that um, society has paid, individuals have paid for these hard uh, won lessons and this hard, uh, this difficult to acquire wisdom that, uh, that people who have gone through this system, either from a family perspective or in uh, an individual perspective, uh, given how much we paid for that, we are fools to not listen, to not hear, to not be informed by the wisdom uh, that those people have acquired. You know, there, there are too many of us who, uh, who walk in blindness and, and in ignorance, um, where right next to us is somebody who has a different experience and has acquired knowledge that is as complicated and as, as sophisticated and as valuable as what you, Zach, acquired you know, in, in a Harvard experience or what we all have acquired in our own lives, yet we fail to listen, we fail to learn, we fail to incorporate those ideas into our work. I agree, and I would offer that if you think you're not impacted by the fact that um, the United States leads the world in incarceration, you're absolutely wrong. Because I, I would just point to three 25s. We have 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's prisoners. Now I think we have about 25% of the world's COVID cases. And we have 25, we produce 25% of the world's um, pollution. And so we have really adopted this mindset of entire communities being disposable. And that has hurt 
all of us. Um, it has meant that um, we tolerate 53 cents of every federal dollar going towards war. We tolerate, you know, states spending huge amounts of their budgets on incarceration. Um, in California, from 1980 to 2000, we built 23 new prisons and just one new university. In, in city after city, in every city in this country, the lion's share of resources are going to policing and each time a recession has happened over the last 40 years, there's one aspect of every county, city, state budget that doesn't get cut. And that's punishment, that's prisons, that's policing. And those are the same things that we have seen accelerate the morbidity and the mortality of black and brown people. And so I think our, our uh, you know, Ronald Reagan used to talk about small government, but I think that really what he should have said is that the only good government is a death government, that we seem to be fixated on focusing and funding the things that actually um, do us most harm and exacerbate poverty, uh, cycles of poverty and incarceration. And I think that that hurts all of us, that when we operate from this framework of fear, that um, we have um, really devalued everyone's life and livelihood. And that's why I think the, the, the very simple slogan of just saying Black Lives Matter has resonated in a, such a almost revolutionary way because we have devalued so much of our uh, human family's life in this country. And I think that there's an opportunity to begin to shift that. And that's why I think, you know, budgets are really moral documents and how we shape our budgets really need to reflect the values that we hold as a society. And Paula, you know, do, do you see some hope here when, when you have uh, conservative organizations like the Koch Brothers Network advocating for a real shift in how we uh, invest and how we treat incarceration, uh, how we invest in society and how we treat in in incarceration, where you have uh, multi-ethnic um, uh, uh, marchers who are there protesting that black lives matter, not less, not more, as much, mm. right? Black lives matter, which was clearly not the case in so many of these incidents that have been videotaped for our eyes to see it. Do you see hope for a change, Paula? You know, I, I do. Um, I'm always hopeful. Um, and I think that this moment has, has transcended into a movement that I hope continues. I think that um, for black and brown folks and the, the community of people that I represent are no longer asking um, for the government, for private stakeholders to do what they should do, and that is to, to make sure that all humans have access to care, whether they have been, um, if, whether they've been incarcerated, whether they are poor, no matter what, that they should invest in those communities that have often been disenfranchised and have been dismissed. Um, I am happy and encouraged by I would say the the rainbow and the sea of different faces and races and genders and ages who have gotten into this fight. I mean, we've been on the ground again, it's 50 years and, and just personally, I grew up in the Midwest in Cleveland, Ohio, and my parents um, were community advocates and they were, were deeply staunched and um, per progressive thinking and movement and, and we're on the front line. So that is my history. I've always, that's always been embedded in me and that's a responsibility that we speak up for those who are voiceless and can't speak up for themselves. And so I think that we have to capitalize on this moment um, and the fact that there is so much interest that we have allies that um, Ordinarily, we would not and force them to do the right thing. I think that we move beyond asking. We're at the point where we're demanding. I, and I agree with Zach that budgets are our moral compass and that um, even here in the district, you know, 
we are working with our government stakeholders and, sh and challenging private um, stakeholders to invest in those communities and these issues to move forward because Black Lives Matter isn't just a slogan. It really means that all people, that Black folks, their lives matter, that they should be afforded the same opportunity. And I think that that argument gets lost. It gets and it goes into um, almost as, as a begging as if, oh, should we invest in these people? Should we invest in these communities? These are our, we're all the same. And so I think that um, if, if we have um, stakeholders and other organizations that are saying that they are allies in this fight, then not only does it need to speak with their words, it needs to speak with their dollar. And a lot of that money should be going directly to community-based organizations like Voices for a Second Chance and other colleague and partner um, agencies who are on the front lines working with returning citizens and their families. My agency works with over 4,000 people a year um, and we touch more people than a lot of the larger organizations or government agencies, and they all depend on us to be that first entree. So again, we have to think about it. If everyone is really, really want to change the trajectory of the racism, structural, institutionalized, and it's been threaded throughout all of our systems, then we need to see that in, in the investments and not just in the words. There are people who are very oriented on uh, punishment. The whole idea of if somebody has broken the law, that punishment is the consequence, and that is a deterrent, and it is also earned. The real question for me is not that, although that's a really big uh, point of debate. The real question to me is when does punishment ever end? Mm. How do you, how do you, once somebody has, we talk about paying your debt to society. Okay, let's say you buy into that idea. When does the punishment end and what do we do? What do we do to help that punishment to end as opposed to continuing to stretch it out through the life of, uh, of someone and through multiple generations? Do you have any answers for that, uh, each of you? Zach, um, uh, why don't you start and then Paula, could you jump in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would encourage listeners to really challenge that assumption that punishment works, that it is, because I think embedded in it is the idea that we're holding people accountable. Um, but my experience with accountability is that in order to be accountable, you have to be answerable. And in, cor in order to be answerable to someone, you actually have to be in relationship with someone. So I have harmed you, Mark, and um, then I am removed and sent to some faraway prison um, and spend years of my life locked up there. That actually, um, and victims now report this, uh, Californians for Safety and Justice did a report saying that most victims of crime support rehabilitation, they support restorative justice and, and report much higher satisfaction rates with restorative justice because with restorative justice, the person who has caused the harm has to sit down with the person um, who they've harmed, surrounded by people that support them and actually make amends and do their best to make that situation right. Um, and that is not always possible in terms of bringing things back to what, what happened prior to the harm but it is um, real accountability because that person then has to make amends. And so our perception is that there is an opportunity to shift our approach to safety away from one that um, relies on the separation and the end of relationship to actually build community, build relationship and, and real accountability can happen because of that. And I think um, that that process of people coming together to create an accountability plan and to uh, ensure that the person has, who has caused harm actually has to make amends 
is really important for our democracy because what we see happening now is that the people in the corner offices are, are not being held accountable. It's just the people on the corners. The people in the suites and the, in the big corporate offices are not being held accountable. It's the folks on the streets who are, who are being sent to jail. And so we need desperately for our democracy to begin to develop systems of accountability that wouldn't just hold those folks who are most marginalized accountable, but really to hold all institutions accountable. And that's what I think the Black Lives Matter movement is about, is really demanding more systemic accountability. And so I would encourage folks to, to really question whether or not um, our system has produced accountability in the ways that we think it has. I'm gonna give you the last word, Paula. I just wanted to jump in here because I wanted to relate a, a very quick uh, story about what, what happened to me. I've been in fights. Um, I've been assaulted. I haven't always come out on top. I've been in police lineups. Um, I, 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 I've had these experiences. And in one case, um, uh, the consequence was that the person ended up being incarcerated. It was a rather serious situation. It was a series of assaults. Uh, one person um, was very ser seriously injured. Um, and then uh, my assault happened afterwards. Um, and I was part of, part of a police lineup and that person ended up being incarcerated. Your point, Zach, is that we never got a chance to interact after that. We never got a chance to, to talk about the thing that we both experienced, the, the people who assaulted me and me. We never got a chance to figure out what, what went on at that, in those moments. Um, and that isolation, that separation meant that none of us were able to work through our issues if we were willing, if we would have been willing. That, that opportunity was not afforded, that isolation. And who knows what happened to those, um, those men who, who, uh, who went on with, with their lives. Um, and and that, is, that point that you're making is so important, right? Punishment might be part of, of what needs to, needs to go on, but if there's no recovery, then all we're left is pain uh, throughout. Uh, uh, Paula, I, I just wanted to, to, to share that because you would, you would talk about that sort of sense of isolation. Um, and, and that needs to really be thought through because uh, this point of we're, we're in this country together, we're living next to each other, we need to be talking to each other. Uh, Paula? Yeah, um, thank you for sharing that, Mark. And I, and I agree with that experience. There's also another experience when it comes to punishment and the fact that um, sentencing disparity and the fact that black folks are held to a different account than any other race of people. And that oftentimes what is not factored into understanding their situation is that many of them have been victimized. That's been our experience. Many of them have been experienced victimization throughout their lives, with had, which may have brought them into whatever criminal activity that led to them being sentenced and to ultimately to their incarceration. And so I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that before you can get to the punishment, if there were prevention and intervention programming and more focus on the fact that many Black folks who live in impoverished area who are not exposed to the opportunity that, that all of us have had throughout our lives um, tend to be led to um, a situation that is pessimistic and that they can't, they don't see hope. They don't see anything outside of their radius and they tend to lend towards maybe criminal activity that then leaves them scarred. And I mean scarred throughout their lives because they continue to, to live in punishment throughout their lives whether they remain on probation, whether they live with the stigma of incarceration, it limits their opportunities for full reintegration. So I think that when we look at punishment, the restorative piece absolutely is one that I support and I think that we should, we should lead. But I also don't want to be absent or forget the fact that many of the folks who have been incarcerated have not been incarcerated 
for, um, I would say, real crimes in the sense um, that that adheres to the fact of what their sentence is. And so they're left scarred with that and they always are playing catch up and there aren't opportunities presented for them where they can fully be engaged in our society. And I don't want that to be absent because those folks, I, I believe that we're speaking for them in this movement about Black Lives Mattering. It has to, every Black life has to matter, no matter the zip code. And that brings us back to Zach's initial point that based in race, treatment can be different. And we end up with a society in which whole groups of people spend the rest of their lives trying to, as you say, Paula, play and catch up. Uh, Zach Norris of the Ella Baker Center and Paula Thompson of the Voices for a Second Chance, thank you so much for uh, helping to inform and educate us about uh, your work and about this uh, terrain that, that many of us don't experience but need to. Uh, that's the nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you so much. And also I wanted to convey from our attendees to you both uh, their thanks and their recognition uh, of your work. This has just been a wonderful session. Thank you all. Have a great day and let's keep the country strong.